Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Hope folks are having a good week so far. Yeah, for those Star Wars fans out there, uh, may the fourth be with you. We've got some good updates and demos to share today from the team. So let's hop on in. From our security research team, Spencer McIntyre will be taking us through the latest and greatest with framework. Spencer? Hello, everyone. Let's talk framework. So we have a bunch of new modules today. Um, we're going to be demoing some of them. Uh, first up is the Nagios XI, uh, continuing uh, community member Eric Winter, along with a couple other authors, work on bringing us some excellent Nagios content. And this is an authenticated remote code execution, which exploits CVE 2020-5791, and was also provided by Chris Lane and Matthew Aberg. Uh, next up in the Nagios camp as well, uh, we also have the SNMP trap authenticated remote code execution. I believe this is the one that we're going to have uh, a demo of today. And this one was also provided by Chris Lynn and uh, Metasploit community member Eric Winter, which exploits CVE 2020-5792. Um, so in addition to that, we also have a cockpit CMS NoSQL I remote code execution uh, provided by, I believe this was ported by community member Hoodie um, with the original uh, vulnerability research done by Nikita Petrov. And this exploits CVE 2020 35846. Uh, next up, we have a module, which is not an exploit, uh, but I believe we'll get a lot of use out of this as Redis is becoming very popular. We have a Redis extractor uh, by Geoff Rainville, and uh, this module can be used to extract and basically scrape information out of Redis uh, versions uh, 2.8 and above. Now, I just want to give a, a, a shout out to newer mem uh, Metasploit community member uh, Smashery for uh, helping out uh, get this module landed. Um, so this is pretty great. So we can now target and pull useful information out of Redis instances. Uh, next up, back in the exploit category, we have a remote code execution for Apache Druid 0.20. And this was provided by the Metasploit community, Lich1, and the security team of Alibaba Cloud and JE5442804, targeting CVE 2021-25646. And uh, even more exploits, uh, we have VMware vRealize Operations Manager uh, by the Metasploit team's very own William Vu, who ported that over to Metasploit. And I believe the original vulnerability research was done by Igor Dementroko. And this targeted uh, CVE 2021-21983. Uh, then in addition to that, we have returning Metasploit community member uh, Pedro Barburio, who uh, continued his trend of providing uh, micro-focused content. And so we had a, a default password uh, module for the micro-focus operations bridge reporter. Uh, so those uh, devices ship with a default password on the SSH service, and so this module can target and leverage that to establish a session against vulnerable systems. And then uh, one of the more unique modules that I have seen in recent memory, uh, the Coffee exploit, and that's short for Kiev Offensive Exploit, uh, was provided by a uh, newer community member, Giopino Carstanotino and Iliara Matatui. Uh, and this exploits CVE 2020-8539. Uh, this is a very interesting module. Um, so it does exploit a vulnerability, but is provided as a Metasploit post module that when a user has an established session on a on an Android system, which is specifically the, the Kia head unit, you can actually uh, control aspects of the car. They sent us a demonstration video of this. It was, it was very interesting content. So that was a, that was a pretty cool uh, new piece uh, that came out this week. In addition to that, we have a slew of enhancements and features. I myself added in a session verification for uh, shell sessions, covering both uh, traditional shells on Linux and Windows, as well as PowerShell. Um, so the idea behind this was to ensure that sessions or connections that are established into Metasploit are validated as proper sessions before they're reported to the user to help users avoid running post modules on sessions that are, are invalid from perhaps a, a scanning engine that may have hit their Metasploit instance, that type of thing. 
Uh, Pingport 80 updated the Linux post gather hash dump module um, and improved it so that it could dump uh, the hashes from the etc shadow file even when um, the user is not root. This would be the case when the permissions are set up incorrectly on that shadow file so Metasploit users can still access it. Uh, an older PR from Semper Victus made its way into the framework, and this updated the PowerShell code to be able to utilize RC4 um, for obfuscation. Uh, this used an interesting technique whereby uh, Metasploit would generate a password and encrypt the code and provide the password along with it, and it would be decrypted uh, at runtime. So a nice little obfuscation technique there. Uh, Rapid7's own uh, C. Travis added in the ability to specify individual private keys as a string parameter into the SSH login public key module. Uh, so a great addition to that. And uh, uh, community member uh, Tim Wright added in the necessary functionality to the Java interpreter to resolve host names over DNS. Uh, the Java interpreter was the last interpreter that didn't have this functionality, um, and it will be useful for pivoting uh, network traffic in the future. So kind of rounds that functionality out and closes a feature gap uh, among the interpreters. So thank you to Tim for that. Uh, we also have quite a few bugs that were fixed. Um, our very own Alan Foster um, ensured that the Metasploit JSON RPC service is warmed up and healthy before accepting requests. Uh, Grant Wilcox uh, fixed a bug in one of the new Nagios modules to ensure that the check method works um, even when there are older Nagios versions. Our very own William Vu uh, added uh, an undefined constant error for the F5 uh, big IP known private key issue, which I believe was a very, very big vulnerability that came out last year. So that module is still uh, being maintained and keep, keep uh, kept up to date. Uh, Pingport 80 fixed an issue in the post Linux gather check VM module where a physical machine was being detected as a virtual machine. So he corrected that false positive there. And our own Jeffrey Martin updated the login scanner SSH has been improved. So now it correctly handles cases where the connection might be reset and it's not going to uh, continue stand, uh, scanning instead of throwing a stack trace. Uh, even more bug fixes, um, our own uh, Brendan Waters fixed the RDP web login module. There was a Python string formatting issue where it relied on a, a newer syntax feature in Python version. So we backported that to work on um, some older versions of Python 3, uh, which a uh, quick reminder, uh, all of our external modules that are in Python now are using Python 3. Uh, so wonderful fix there. Um, our very own Christopher Greenlease fixed a crash in Metasploit's console when the users would try to tap complete certain values. Um, if I remember correctly, this was in regards to paths, which is a nicer feature. Um, so that is a great quality of life improvement there. Uh, but that's not all Christopher Greenlease uh, provided to us. He also updated the Microsoft SQL Server, um, the interesting data finder module to correctly handle a scenario where no interesting data uh, was found. Um, so it would simply report that instead of crashing, which of course is uh, never good. Uh, Tim Wright also fixed a bug in how some of the uh, sessions were uh, utilizing subshells, whereas others would not. And this fixed a consistency issue. So when uh, session dash C was used to run a command against all of the interpreters, uh, all of the interpreters act more, more consistently now, which is, which is important when you're running some commands that require shell features to be present. And then uh, community member uh, Smashery also updated the Redis file upload module uh, with a couple of issues that he had identified while uh, working on. Uh, the new Redis extractor module. So thank you very much to all of them um, and all of you in the Metasploit community for, for all of the bug fixes, enhancements, and wonderful module content. Um, as always, every, uh, every week we have the uh, Metasploit weekly wrap up, which you can find on blog.rapid7.com. So uh, you can get your updates even more frequently than the, uh, than the demos uh, from there. So thank you again to everyone in the community. And with that, I believe we're going to roll right into the demos. First up is going to be the VMware VR Ops uh, Manager RCE. Uh, this can be demoed by Shelby, uh, Shelby Pace. Okay, uh, so yeah, so this module was actually written by Will Vu uh, and it affects VMware Virtualize Operations Manager, uh, various versions of it. Um, but you can go ahead and start the video. 
so basically, uh, first it exploits an SSRF vulnerability at the CASA node's thumbprints endpoint, which will eventually leak the maintenance admin credentials. Uh, and then those are used to then uh, basically upload a web shell, uh, a JSP shell specifically um, uh, via, via the credentials that you just gathered and a directory traversal vulnerability. And then you get code execution as the admin user on that device. Nice. Awesome, thank you, Shelby. Does the check face actually leak the credentials or, or was it just a misleading log uh, value? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, does the check face that, uh, actually leak the credentials? Can you actually get loot with the check face only or do you have to actually go through the whole thing to get the... Uh, yeah, the check will do that, yeah. Okay, interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, and then I think I have another one. Yeah, so uh, this is for Apache Druid. Uh, analytics database versions, uh, I think below the 0.20.1. Um, and you can go ahead. And so basically there's a, a feature that allows a user to send um, embedded JavaScript code and in ingestions, um, which is basically just um, like formatted JSON, JSON data. And um, it, it's typically disabled by default. However, um, for vulnerable versions of the software, it can send an ingestion um, with an empty key whose value contains the configuration um, settings for the JavaScript specifically that will uh, actually enable it due to uh, a bug in, I believe, the Jackson library. Um, and so once that's enabled, you can actually, actually you can enable it, you can both enable it and send the uh, JavaScript code in the same request that um, it'll eventually get you code execution. And so that is with uh, the privileges of the user um, running the service. Well, thank you for those demos, Shelby. Uh, next up, we have Grant Wilcox uh, demoing one of the new Nagios content modules. Yeah, so this was the Nagios XI vulnerability effect in Nagios prior, sorry, up to including 5.7.3. So if you just want to play the video, yeah. So we're just going to go ahead and set up this module. Basically, what this does um, is there was a bug in one of the components that allows you to upload arbitrary files. Um, this module will essentially utilize that to upload. Uh, <clears throat> oh, well, it was kind of like a, a job file, but you could use that in turn to um, upload like a backdoor, essentially. So this module will just upload um, a malicious file to the server, it will then send a request to execute that file and will then delete the file once it's done. So I'm just going to go ahead and set the options. Uh, this does require an authenticated Nagios admin user. So you will have to be an uh, authenticated user running as an admin in order for this to work. Um, so let's we'll go ahead and set the options here. Sorry for this screen stutter, it was just some switching between VMs. So we do also support the check method with this. So this will authenticate the target and grab the version and then check to see if that's vulnerable. Uh, this check will also be run automatically when you try to exploit the target. You can disable this with set force exploit false. Sorry, set force exploit true, my bad, um, if you want to just exploit the target anyway without checking it. Um, so you can see we uploaded the PHP shell, that's the backdoor. Uh, this backdoor then allows you to execute an arbitrary command and we use that to then get our shell and subsequently delete the shell once you're done. So <laughs> delete the backdoor, my bad. Um, and then if you, get the user ID, we can see we're running as the Apache user. Um, and if we just check the directory that we're in and all the system information, we can see that we're, it's the flight target. So this target was run CentOS uh, 7 
for the Nautilus XI, and you can see we're in the uh, auto discovery jobs uh, folder, which is where the shell was uploaded. We seem to be getting a lot of Nagios uh, uh, modules lately. I don't know. I maybe swear, just I swear this is <laughs> this is going to be the last one for a while. But uh, yeah, I think we <laughs> had a few of about five of them. So this is the end of that. Uh, wow. Collection of. Nice. Awesome, thank you, Grant. And you have a second demo here for uh, some reline and shell history improvements. Yeah, so this was an interesting PR that came in from Pinport 80, um, one of our newer contributors. So I'll just go ahead and demonstrate this. Um, essentially what was happening was uh, that we had some issues with um, some of the commands that were being saved to history in particular if they contained any white space before or after the command um, it would result in a little bit of a different output um, so you can see here I just want to pause the video for five six um, you can see what's happening here is that if we normally execute the history command um, so this is after the patch by the way so it's a little bit harder to see it here but if you, if you were before this patch to execute the history command and then execute another history command with spacing in front of it, as you can see that, that we've done just here, we would actually have two separate commands in the history file. Um, and this was because the read line and subsequently the shell that RD uh, file were not uh, stripping the white space before they saved it. Um, this resulted in some very confusing instances where you might have one command and then you accidentally hit the tab and now you've got like the same command again in your history, um, which may, because that history file was also used when you hit the up and down arrow keys to scroll back through your history, it could mean you could have junk um, entries within your history, which aren't really that useful. So if you just want to play the video here. Um, you can see that now it's it's not saving that extra uh, history command. It's just going, hey, you already executed it. You've just got white space around it. We're not going to log like an additional entry because um, there's no point in doing that. Um, now, one of the other things that's kind of cool is we did also add the option to, if you start the command with a space, it will not be saved to history. Um, this is useful for setting sensitive options such as passwords. So you can see here we've got a sensitive password, just an example, um, and that's not logged to history. So we'll just go ahead through this. Um, just give me a sec. I... Oh, sorry. So what I was showing there, um, if you just want to pause the video for five seconds. Um, what I was trying to show there, which is a little bit hard to see, was I was upspacing, uh, sorry, hidden up and down on the arrow keys to scroll through the history. And you can see that it also doesn't show up in the history either. So um, it won't show up by the history command, it won't show up by scrolling up and down through the history, and it also won't be saved to the history file, as we'll see later. So if you just want to play that now. Um, so now I'm just going to set the password. Normally, this is purely just to show that the um, it, if you don't start it with a space, it will be logged to history normally. So no issue with that. It's just if you've got a space before the start of the command um, that sets some option or just any command it doesn't have to be set. Um, if you start that command uh, in Mature, so in Metasploit with a space, it will not log it to history. Um, so now we're just going to cut the history file, and you can see the non sensitive password was saved to history, but the sensitive password, because we started that command with a space, uh, white space, um, it won't log it to history. So this matches on both sides, both the history file and the internal history file in Metasploit, which is actually um, handled by a different library. So this is why we had to update the two libraries to make this work and be compatible with one another. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the rest of the video is kind of a repeat of what I showed previously. So if you just want to pause that. Awesome, thank you, Grant.
can definitely see being able to uh, prevent passwords from being uh, written down to the history file and written onto disk as uh, being something nice. Yeah, definitely. All right, and I believe this is our last demo uh, by Christoph, um, who is going to uh, demo the Git T and Gogs Git Hook RCE module that he wrote. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the uh, Git T and Gogs uh, are self-hosted Git services. Uh, basically, Git T, Git T, sorry, is a fork of Gogs. So both products are vulnerable to the same issue, and uh, as we will see, the uh, the workflow is exactly the same. So uh, this module, uh, at least our two modules, are uh, uh, leverage an insecure setting to get remote code execution on the targets uh, on, on, on the target OS. So this is possible when the current user is allowed to create Git hooks. Uh, which is the default for administrative user. So if you if you don't have any uh, administrative user, you will need to have the specific permission for this. So th this is usually granted by uh, by a, an administrator, for example, when they want their user to be able to create Git hooks on repository. So um, can you please go ahead and, and stop the video? Thank you. So uh, there is a, so here we have a Git T version one twelve six, and uh, we're going to check this user, um, uh, MSF user, and uh, here we can see that it he has the permission to create Git hooks, which is default for administrative user. Um, so. The workflow is uh, the module authenticates to the web interface. It then creates a temporary repository and sets a post receive Git hook with the payload. So this post receive Git hook will be triggered each time uh, you push code to the repository. So the module just creates a dummy file and push it to the, to the repository. So this action will trigger the Git hook and execute the payload. Um, so here we're setting the basic options and uh, the remote port is the default one, 3000. There is a check method we can run to get the version. And uh, here is the execution and we got a session. So the user is the user that is actually running Git T uh, well, server. Uh, no, sorry, yeah, the, the Git user, yeah. Okay, so now let's do this with Gogs. So there is another instance here on a different port uh, with uh, Gogs in, installed. So we're gonna check the same thing we have a user, I created a user which has the same kind of permission. The interface is a bit different, but the logic is uh, the same. There we go, I'm gonna select the GUGS Git Hooks RCE module. The, the options are pretty much the same. I created the, the same test account. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the only difference is the remote port. We have to set uh, 3001 because it's on the same host. All right. We have a, a check method too, but this one cannot detect the versions, just detect if GOGS is installed. All right. And we got a session. So it's exactly the same uh, workflow. So about mitigations, uh, Git version 1.13 uh, has mitigated this by uh, setting the disable Git hooks configuration setting to true by default. So this setting actually disable Git hooks. 
So you're not, you won't be able to uh, set any Git hooks, even if you're, a, a, um, even if you're an administrator. Uh, on the other hand, Gogs has no mitigation implemented so far. So let, the, the, the latest stable version is uh, 0.12.3 from last year, and uh, there is no mitigation for this. Uh, yeah, that's it. Do you have uh, any idea how popular uh, GitT and, and Gogs are, Christoph? I, I'm new to them, but uh, that doesn't mean they're, they could be popular. I don't know. Um, I, I don't have numbers for this, sorry, but uh, there's they're quite used because they're very lightweight. It's it's very light implementation. It kind of runs uh, like on very small platform, very a uh, 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 little platform like a Raspberry Pi or something like this. Interesting. Um, and uh, so it's, I think it's popular, but I I don't have the numbers, so I cannot say uh, for sure. Understood. Uh, this this looks like a, a you know powerful set of modules. Uh, well, good stuff. Just to add some numbers. There's twenty five thousand stars for Git on GitHub and forty thousand stars for Gogs. I don't know how many people are using that in enterprise environments, but there's definitely a lot of people interested in it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. a good good metric there. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. I appreciate the demo, Christoph. That's cool. Thank you. And I think that wraps up all of our framework content. So I'll hand it back over to you, Pierce, uh, to attack uh, for Attacker KB. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer. And thank you, everyone, for the demos and the content. Great stuff, as always. Um, we'll segue into Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base, a website for discussing which bones matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com. It's right there. Um, I see we we'll go to an update uh, with uh, team member Matthew Kino. Uh, Matthew? Hey, thanks, Pierce. So we've had a couple of uh, injections into uh, the uh, what we've been working on lately, but we're still moving forward. Uh, so as a quick update, we have a few small bug fixes and minor enhancements. Uh, one, we found an edge case where the incorrect uh, assessment count was being displayed. Uh, again, and it's a it's a far edge case. So there were some certain conditions that had to be met. Most people would not have seen this uh, show up on their profile, for example. But it has been corrected. In addition, it was a, a request from the community that uh, we make the link on our AKB notification emails clickable to get you back to the homepage. So that's been updated. Uh, Twitter OAuth integration is in the final review process. So we hope to have that delivered very soon. Uh, so you can now log in with Twitter instead of GitHub or both. And we are also in the midst of IPIMS research for our Rapid7 customers who have IPIMS accounts so that they will be able to soon authenticate and use Attacker KB with that account. And that's all. Excellent.